We're here joined by Richard Nade. He's Goldman Sachs vice chairman. And of course, what we're talking about is not only the 10,000 Global Business Summit, which is sponsored by Bloomberg and Goldman Sachs, but actually markets in general. If you look at the economic cycle at the moment, Richard, and thank you for joining us, um, what do small businesses need in, in this kind of environment? Well, firstly, they should be taking advantage of the opportunity. You know, globally, there's a terrific upswing. Obviously, here in the UK, maybe it's a little bit more challenging. <clears throat> but this is a time to be optimistic. It's a time to be investing in your businesses. Mm -hmm. And it's a time to be looking for growth. I mean, obviously, one has to have an eye to the horizon and make sure that what you're doing is sustainable long term. But this really is a time to be investing and, and looking to enhance productivity. Uh, and there's only one way to achieve that, and that's to engage with partners, engage with your people, embrace the digi digital economy and look forward. But if you look at um, trade tensions, they seem to be escalated. We don't exactly know where this will end. How should markets view it? How should businesses view it? Well, I think markets are speaking right now. Obviously, markets were down overnight, and you know that's, that started as we went into the back end of last week. This is going to play out over a long period of time. The reality is there are some fundamental imbalances in the global economy. You know, when I go to the US, you know, this is really an issue that seems to unite people across the political spectrum. You know, there's real passion and conviction about these imbalances and what needs to be done to deal with them. So I think there's going to have to be a big global conversation. Um, the status quo is, does not seem to be sustainable. So somehow we're going to have to navigate. And the question is, can we do it through evolution and can we do it through discussion? Or do tensions really have to escalate? Does it mean that we'll see more volatility in the markets? And is it the good type of volatility for a bank or is it the, the difficult type? Well, of course, the first day of volatility is, is always tricky because it depends where you're positioned and, uh, and what the outlook is. But obviously, you know, a big part of our business is providing liquidity into the markets and, and intermediating this sort of risk. And so as volatility returns to the markets, and you, you're focused on trade tensions, you know, the other thing to focus on is QE and central banks stepping back from the markets. They've been such big providers of liquidity and, and really lowering volatility across the marketplace. As they step back, there will be more volatility. And, and overall, that's obviously good for our business. What do you think the, the, the main volatility will come from or the fault lines in the markets? Is it through central banks or is it geopolitics? Well, it's very difficult to anticipate <laughs> geopolitics. Yeah, we live in a particularly unpredictable, unpredictable world right now. Yeah, certainly central banks coming out of the marketplace will lead to volatility going up. And um, whether that's accompanied by geopolitical concerns, you know, time will tell. Um, are you expecting more IPOs or are you expecting more fintech IPOs after, for example, the IPO of Adian last week? Well, that was obviously a terrific success and shows the market appetite for such, for such companies. And there, there is a large number of them across Europe. You know, we focus on what comes out of Silicon Valley. The fact is the European tech space has grown very, very significantly. We, we hold a technology um, conference every year. And if I just look over the last four or five years when I've been hosting that, just the level of attendance, the quality of the companies, the size of the companies you know, has grown significantly. And obviously, a lot of them are looking to come to market. So I, I think we'll see, we'll see more. But overall, you think businesses think that this is the right time to come to market? Absolutely. Despite the volatility? Despite the volatility. In fact, we saw, yeah, if you look at the IPOs that took place last week, yeah, they've all traded very, very well post-issuance. Post you go back a month or two, it was actually more challenging. But I think sellers' price expectations yeah, have adjusted somewhat, and, you know, and, I th and I think the markets are looking for ways to invest their money, and particularly in businesses that are you know, looking to the future and are part of the new economy. I think they're, they're exciting opportunities for people. Um, Richard, talk to me a little bit about your online lender in Germany. Um, do you think that the you know, consumer bank can actually make money and be profitable in that country given it's quite cutthroat? Absolutely. We wouldn't be doing it if we didn't think we, could, we, we couldn't build a profitable business. But I think this goes to a broader question about you know, the European financial system and, uh, and what Europe wants its financial system to look like. Obviously, it has to have a system that's fit for purpose that can fund growth and investment across, across Europe. And I think some of these broader initiatives are really, really key. I think banking union needs to get completed. I think the deposit guarantee scheme needs to be put into place. Capital markets union, there's going to have to be a balance in that economy between 
you know, sourcing finance from the banking sector and sourcing it from the markets. And I, it, there's a lot of work that needs to be put into the capital markets infrastructure, you know, which will help, which will help drive growth. A, and the industry needs to be sustainable on its own footing. It has to drive the right sort of returns for its shareholders, so that it can attract more capital. If, we, we, we often talk about why did the U.S. come out of the you know, last financial crisis more quickly than Europe. I think one of the reasons is that their financial system got up and running more quickly. Capital mm -hmm. markets played a big role. But what are the chances of getting a banking union in the next even 10, 15 years, given some of the politics that we see in southern Europe that may be uh, pushing Germany to be a lot more cautious? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's short-term issues and, and, and longer-term issues. I, I, if you're committed to the European project, if anything, for me, this is a time to lead in and, and actually drive integration more aggressively. You know, if we're going to finish this journey, the sooner we get to the finish line, the better. And I think you, you leave yourself exposed with uncompleted tasks. It makes for a much riskier journey. So I, I, th I think from a political imperative, this is a time actually to lean in and get some of these things done. I recognize the short-term ob obstacles, but we've got to have leaders that will take us through those. I know you talked about consolidation in the banking industry with our Matt Miller a couple of weeks ago, but is it only with the banking union that you see more appetite for consolidation? Is Europe not overbanked? Yeah, look, there are pluses and minuses to you know, each of these potential transactions. Uh, and I think up until this point, people have been focused on the negatives and they've outweighed the positives. I think we're getting to a point, and I think you see this in the increased dialogue, where people are really challenging, challenging themselves as to, you know, is this the time to move? And I, I think over the next period of time, we will see some more transactions. Obviously, the regulatory framework can help enhance that and make it easier. But I think some of these things will happen despite the re regulatory framework.